Well, good morning, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where in the world uh, you are and, uh, and where you're joining from. Uh, I hope you and your loved ones are safe uh, wherever you are. These are very uncertain and difficult times. So, uh, so the fact that we can be here um, right now together through this platform is, uh, is a sign that, uh, that we're safe and, uh, and that we can, can work. And for that, we should be very thankful and, um, and lucky in these times. Uh, I'm Ramon Cruz and I'm the International Pub uh, Policy um, Director at the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, ITDP, which is an organization that uh, has uh, seven offices around the world uh, that promotes uh, sustainable and equitable transport systems. Uh, worldwide. Um, there were close to, I think, uh, 500 people or so registered for this session from all over the world. And uh, of course, would have been much better to uh, be meeting in front of each other and share experience and network and learn from each other. Uh, but that's, of course, not possible these days. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, this has presented, of course, uh, new possibilities uh, and more people to participate and to learn from each other, something that in previous moments, of course, would have been only available for those people that, that has a means to travel to specific locations. So, uh, so we're thankful also for the opportunity to uh, reach to more people, no? And I, I want to, uh, to recognize and thank our co-organizers with this session, the International Association for Public Transport, UITP, and we're also very thankful for uh, to the Transport Decarbonization Alliance and the Partnership for Sustainable Low Carbon Transport, or SLOCAD, and the many other organizations uh, and governments like the government of the Netherlands, who is chairing the TDA for this forum uh, en route to COP26. So thanks to all of them for, uh, for this effort to uh, bring basically all time zones around the world in a program uh, that runs uh, basically for half of the day uh, and that you can join from uh, wherever you are. So thank you so much for everybody and for all of you, of course, uh, for joining us here today um, in this session about rethinking urban mobility and urban space and prior, how to prioritize people. And of course, with all the new challenges and new paradigm, paradigms that, uh, that this uh, new situation with COVID-19 has presented us, no? So, uh, so first we're going to uh, have an announcement from uh, Philip Turner from UITP. And then we're going to, um, in this session, then have, uh, um, um, then have, uh, sorry, I think uh, somebody may have joined now. So um, in any case, so running through the, I'm running right now for those of you that just joined, running right now through the, uh, the program uh, that, um, that we're having for this session. And so we'll hear first from Philip Turner uh, with an announcement from UITP, then we will I make out here from who's the chief knowledge officer for ITDP uh, will set the, the context of what is the 15 minute city you now with uh, complete streets with uh, um, prioritizing people uh, in uh, neighborhoods in cities. Then we will have a panel of case studies and what's happening from around the world. We will start with our keynote speaker who's Manuel Araujo the mayor of the city of Kilimani in Mozambique. Uh, and, um, and then we will um, have um, different uh, case studies from around the world. We're going to start with Anna Hutnen um, from the City Cap project in the city of Lahti in Finland. Then Mariana Gomez, who's uh, the urban planner for the municipality uh, of Fortaleza in Brazil. Uh, we'll hear from Lily Matson, who's the Chief Safety, Health and Environment Officer for Transport for London. And to wrap that panel, uh, Yunus Arikan, who's the Director of Global Advocacy for ICLE, um, and the, also the local governments and municipal authorities focal point 
for the uh, UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So, um, so with that, I, oh, and then lastly, to off, uh, offer some conclusions and closing remarks, we're going to hear from Dionisio Gonzalez uh, from our partner organization, uh, UITP. So with that, uh, since we're running just a few minutes uh, um, later, I'll pass the, uh, the spotlight to Philip Turner from UITP. Um, thank you very much and um, good afternoon or evening actually, everyone. Um, so I will endeavor to share my screen um, here and uh, right, I believe that that's up and running. So thank you all for joining us. And um, I think en route, um, the sessions that we're organizing is all about the, the, transi the transition to a zero carbon transport environment. And I think really for me that that, that means that everyone needs to do their bit, um, be that from the transport sector, but I also think that, that that means every person has to do their bit. And if we are going to do that, I think really we have to take advantage of the full potential of the solutions are out there and we have to really look beyond technology solutions um, because we can see significant mitigation reductions through shifting to walking, cycling and public transport. Uh, the IPPC says that emissions can reduce by 50% in an urban context and I think that's quite significant and relevant to this session that we're talking about that UITB has joined the UNFCCC's Race to Zero campaign because through our declaration this is a pledge for the public transport sector to be carbon neutral by 2050 um, and really the centre of this is about decarbon uh, in terms of its operations and through this we've urgently called our members and city uh, transport providers around the globe to urgently pledge the highest level ambition um, in the build up to COP26. And I think we can only really achieve that with the necessary support. Um, but I think that, that this model of a public transport um, really oriented city, the full mitigation benefits, I think are not really widely acknowledged or really understood and it's because of this UITP has developed a methodology which we have termed transit avoided carbon which aims to really account for the emissions avoided through greater urban densification um, in addition to the modal chip benefits of um, public transport walking and cycling but also how it helps to improve city transport efficiency through reduced congestion, for instance. And so we've started to test this methodology in different cities around the globe. And what it really does show is that public transport helps to avoid around 20 times more emissions than it actually produces. So if I put that in the context of Montreal and Canada, this represents about half of all the emissions of the transport sector uh, in that city, which has been avoided. And I think that's quite a significant reduction in emissions and far greater than, than what we actually anticipate and what we see. And I think the important thing for us, and this goes back to our announcement, is that if you decarbonize the public transport sector, a, you get the full benefits of transit avoided carbon. Um, but also, secondly, the absolute mitigation reductions from doing that is actually relatively minor. But for the individual, it is hugely significant because you can actually decarbonize millions of people's journeys every single day. And I think this is especially important for those people on lower incomes because they are the ones that ne can't necessarily afford an electric car. And I think the other important thing about this methodology and a commitment is that 
it helps to account the CO2 benefits of a 15 minute city. Because really this model that we're talking about is a public transport oriented city, which is key to a 15 minute city, because it's all about bringing cities back to the people and it's ensuring better connectivity, it's ensuring better accessibility through multimodal sustainable transport options. And really, I think for me, this is really key because it's also about delivering on the urban sustainable development goals, which is talking about enhancing public transport. And what we see by doing that, which is a core principle of better and healthier cities, is that I think for me in this current context, it provides a huge window of opportunity because what we can see is that it brings about better cities in terms of how we can breathe, how we can move, but also how we can stimulate our economy. And I think really the session here today is how can we achieve this 15 minute city and what role sustainable transport options can play. So thank you all very much for joining and that's enough for me. So back to you, Ramon. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Um, and so continuing with the, I think uh, Philip, if you can stop sharing the, yep. Perfect, the screen, thanks so much. Uh, again, Philippe and UITP. Um, I um, now, would, following with our program, would like to introduce my, our um, um, keynote speaker for this session, uh, who is Manuel. Oh, hello. Oh, sorry, sorry, no. Um, sorry to, for the, actually go back to the previous uh, slide. Um, um if you if you may um because the the actually following with the um, with the program we will first uh, have a, an introduction to the main topic of the of the uh of our session uh, that is the 15 minute city and with that uh, it's going to be Aime Gautier who's uh, my colleague at uh, ITDP and the Chief Knowledge Officer uh, for ITDP. So uh, I may, if you can uh, please go first, thanks. I'm muted. <laughs> Did I manage to unmute myself? <laughs> yep, That's you're, you're good, thanks. <laughs> Uh, you would think, you know, 20 years into this pandemic, I would have gotten this right, but I haven't. Okay, um, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, for Thanks to everyone uh, for joining us. I think um, I just wanted to start with some reflections about where we are um, and where we need to go. Um, and that's partly the 15-minute neighborhood as, as a solution for rethinking urban mobility. And... Um, it's really great that there's this galvanizing momentum towards COP26, especially as hopefully we're moving through uh, and out of the crisis of the pandemic. But I think there's a lot that we can learn from the pandemic that we can apply towards one, understanding what a 15 minute city needs to be and two, understanding how we can fight climate change. <clears throat> so starting with yesterday, what did we know? Um, we knew uh, despite climate change, we were still building our cities the same as ever, uh, that increased sprawl and inequality. Um, growth in land was outpacing globally, growth in population by three to two. Uh, we were seeing cities that were growing uh, with really rapidly with um, informal investment or inform informal settlements that uh, reflected a lack of sufficient uh, street networks, lack of ba basic services, lack of investment from the public sector. Um, more broadly. And so this is a picture of DAR, a map of DAR on the right, and all the red and orange areas are where the growth is happening. But that's uh, very far outside of the actual core of the city uh, for Dar es Salaam. Uh, we also saw car oriented developments like this one in Yichang in China. Uh, the only way to really get around is through a car. Um, it's very alienating to, to, if you can walk there, to even be there. 
Um, and I think we just really need to understand that the type of urban development that we have in our cities drives uh, climate change. It can either drive us towards uh, mitigation or it can drive us towards uh, more CO2 per capita um, outcomes. And what drives our urban development is our transportation systems. So, and right now our cities aren't being developed with walking or cycling space. And when it does have it, it's not of good quality. Uh, it's obstructed um, by cars, by light poles, what have you. So that's kind of where we're coming from. And then about a year ago, everything changed, sorry. And with everything changing with the pandemic, I think, um, you know, every, people say this, and, and I'm not the first to say this, but the pandemic has really exposed and, and magnified uh, what's broken, what's broken in our systems and what's broken in our cities um, and it's magnified inequalities. Um, so it's kind of laid bare all of the things that we knew were broken before, but really have to address and we're gonna have to address with climate as well. So one of the first things we saw was that there was a lack of public space. Um, and so this is in Jakarta where we see overcrowded public spaces uh, because there's nowhere else to go. What Jakarta did was they repurposed their streets to create open space. This is something that many cities have done. Um, and so when we think about reallocating um, public space, the streets are the place where we have to start. And I wanna just say that streets account for 80% of the city's public space, um, the street right of way. Um, it's our most bountiful. Uh, public space we have, and it is our most sacred, and we do not treat streets like they are holy. So I think this this is a moment to rethink how we actually allocate space on the street, and cities across the world have been doing that through the pandemic, including Jakarta, rethinking um, bike lanes. Like, and these are things that never would have happened if the pandemic hadn't, hadn't happened, which is not great, but like there, there would never have been a cycle lane on this street um, before, like a year ago, that would have been unthinkable, un unconscionable. Same with Mexico City. In Cerrentes Avenue, they now have a bike lane on, on In Cerrentes Avenue, where a year ago, that would have been unthinkable. There would have been no way to even start that conversation. In India, we're seeing uh, nationally this galvanizing of cities around cycling with the Cycles for Change uh, challenge that they're doing. That's bringing 107 cities together to really rethink what they're doing and, and plan for and implement this uh, an idea for the future around cycling cities. Ethiopia has added, um, the COVID-19 has added momentum to what they were already doing around NMT. Um, and this is a picture from their Cycling Sundays events that they're now holding once a month. And it's, it's pretty amazing to see the progress that's happened. The other thing that's happened that has, was also, I think, unimaginable before was this idea of this recognition, this broad based recognition of public transit as a public good, as a public utility. Um, what we found during the pandemic was that public transit provides more than just a service to its passengers. It actually kept our cities functioning, running. Um, this is a picture of uh, Trans Jakarta a bus from the Trans Jakarta system taking nurses and doctors to the hospital uh, during the, the height of the pandemic um, back in the spring. The other thing that the pandemic has shown though has uh, also how inequitable and unjust our systems are. So this is in New York uh, after the murder of George Floyd, but we're seeing this around the world. Um, and, it's, and it's really confronting this idea of who is safe and, and free to be uh, in public space. Uh, we're seeing it with the protests in Nigeria against police brutality. We're seeing it in the protests in Namibia against gender-based violence. Um, we, it's, it's what's, what's happening with the pandemic is it's alerting us to who we are, inequitable, unsustainable, um, but it also is showing us who we want to be. And who we want to be is a place that has open space, a place that is grounded in walking and cycling, a place that recognizes the value of transit. So I think that that's um, uh, interesting because, you know, as, as we're here to discuss, the climate crisis continues uh, over the past year. The pandemic didn't stop climate change from wrecking havoc to, to communities around the world, whether it's in Central America, where they just got slammed with a hurricane, whether it's in South Asia, where they hit, got uh, uh, the cyclone, whether it's the wildfires that plagued Australia to California. So the question is, 
what can we learn from the pandemic and what do we need to do to, to, to take that opening for change um, and apply it to the climate crisis? Um, essentially, the question is, how are we gonna use this terrible moment to transfer to transform us to better fight for climate change and to also just transform us for the better? And so the what, <laughs> one answer is the um, 15 minute neighborhood. And essentially the 15 minute neighborhood is where everyone can access their daily uh, needs and essential activities within a walk or a cycle. And it's a direct response to the unsustainable development and transportation patterns from yesterday. Um, and as Philip was saying, like this is essentially a way to say we wanna decarbonize our transport by creating integrated and connected communities that are stitched together by transit. Um, but I also think the 15 minute neighborhood is a response to what we're seeing with the pandemic um, about what we value. And I think unfortunately with the pandemic, it's become, I mean, it's been clear, but I think it became even more clear that we make it really hard to be a human in the city. We make it really hard to take care of ourselves and take care of each other in a city. We undervalue the activities needed for well being and the economy of care by over focusing on the productive economy, on the commute, on economic efficiency, which is, is super important. I get that. But we also, like, so is maintaining households, so is getting children to school, so is, um, taking care of each other. So we've seen our transportation systems have been designed around this kind of neutral norm, which is the male commuter, male able-bodied commuter. Um, and what we haven't really taken into account of when we think about city design and transportation design um, as seriously as we should, is that a lot of our trips are for caretaking activities. So 47% of all the trips in Santiago, according to a survey done by Lake, are for caretaking activities. 16% in the US are, for com are, are, are only for commuting trips. Um, so I think we need to do better about making sure that our places reflect well being and health. Um, that's why it could be so revolutionary. It's anti sprawl, but pro climate. It's anti inequity and pro access. It's pro people and pro well being. So, what is a 15 minute neighborhood? It is having local destinations, supermarkets, schools, uh, shoe repair, <laughs> bakeries, pharmacies, doctors, having that all within a walking or cycling distance um, that's built on a fine grain street grid that has basic services, water, sewage, stormwater management. But these things are grounded, these communities are grounded in walking and cycling and they're connected by transit. Transit is the, the connective tissue between all the different communities. What are the conditions for walking and cycling? The first thing is this fine grain street grid, um, but it's also having dedicated and safe space uh, and also having places uh, that you can go to. So the land use piece of it's really important. We also need to be thinking about our streets and in public spaces around health and well-being. thinking about green spaces. This is also a climate response as we think about um, increasing extreme weather events, uh, increasing air pollution, um, increasing um, heat island effects. So like we really need to be rethinking how we think about streets around green infrastructure. And we also need to create spaces for play, recreation, exercise activity, co uh, convening uh, for adults and children. Like uh, we aren't designing cities that are particularly friendly for children these days. Um, and we also need to have those spaces. And finally, the thing that undergirds all of it is that it's connected by frequent and reliable transit. The way that you get frequent and reliable transit is you have dedicated space for transit in the street. So when you talk about reallocating space, uh, you think about making sure there's dedicated space for transit. And finally, I just wanna add on uh, at the end, like when we talk about the 15 minute neighborhood, we have to be very clear about 15 minutes for whom. Right now, the trend, the yesterday trend is that short distances are a luxury. We need to reverse that. Um, and we also need to take into account that not everyone, again, as, as not everyone has access to public space, um, not everyone feels safe or welcome, um, and certain people are more policed uh, in public space than others. So just to make a call for intersectional approaches as we move forward with climate change, we have to bring equity and climate together um, what we've seen with the pandemic and what we see with climate change already is that the poorest and the most marginalized bear the brunt um, of what happens in a crisis. Um, and so we have to be really mindful about that. Um, 
and just make sure that we're being clear about for whom and with whom too. I think planning needs to involve talking to these communities that normally aren't represented, making sure that they're part of the planning process. Um, when we did that in Jakarta, we found that uh, what the women really wanted was safe access to schools. Um, and what we found in Recife was that it wasn't the mobility options that were the issue, it was the crime and gender violence that was the biggest um, constraint with uh, mobility for, for women. So uh, on just one last note, um, one of the things that we've seen from the pandemic is this kind of emerging rising uh, action around cycling and the 15 minute neighborhood uh, can be grounded in cycling. And so I think going forward, ITDP is going to be um, really um, investing and understanding what cycling cities can do to create the 15 minute neighborhood and more sustainable cities and be a, a actionable tool for climate change. Um, and then I guess that's it. Uh, I just wanna say that cities have been at the forefront of all this innovation and change. They're still gonna be on the forefront. I'm really excited to hear from the next three cities four cities, um, and so thanks everyone. That's it, back to you, Ramon. Oh, okay, thanks so much, Jaime, for that presentation. Uh, are we back on, uh, I think, the spotlight to move it here to continue our program? So yes, now then we're, uh, going to hear next from our keynote speaker um, who's um, the uh, the mayor of Kilimani which is a coastal city in Mozambique of about 350,000 people and uh, Manuel de Araujo um, has been very active in uh, in these circles and uh, it's a known uh, known to many of us uh, in 2017 he was elected uh, vice president for Africa uh, uh, of ICLE, which is, uh, mm -hmm. is, as many of you know, it's a global network and organization representing local governments uh, for sustainability. Uh, and then in 2018, he, uh, since 2018, he has been a member of the Global Executive Committee uh, in charge of resilience. And, uh, and again, a great partner. He's uh, one of our champions and a model of uh, best efforts uh, in Africa. He's a great advocate for cycling and actually I will just share the, the, the screen just uh, briefly for a few seconds uh, to, uh, uh, to show uh, just some visuals of a um, bike lane that they have been um, going to be actually announcing and, on, and studying for the feasibility of it. And as soon as I can, um, let's see. Here, it's just very briefly for a few seconds. Let's see, share, okay. And um, here, hmm. okay. Okay, back uh, back here in the Zoom world. Uh, well, thanks so much uh, again for joining us. Uh, Señor Perfeito, uh, muito obrigado por estar aqui. Uh, many th uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mayor de Araujo, uh, for uh, being here with us. And I will pass the, uh, the screen then to you. Uh, if you can unmute yourself. And the floor is yours, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Buenas tardes, buenas tardes. Muchas gracias, Jamor. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity 
to share the story and the experience of uh, Kelimane City. As Hamo just said, Kelimane is a medium-sized port coastal city with uh, an ambitious to lead the transition to sustainable transport. Uh, as uh, Hamon said, it has a population of about 350,000 to 400,000 and uh, relatively low GDP per capita. But uh, our leadership at the city council is determined to show and to share with the world that uh, it's cycling of a urban transport system. The municipality is in the process of building cycle lines to connect the main re residential areas to the markets and commercial zone. And actually we are upgrading sidewalks to improve the experience of pedestrians. So with this investment in support of infrastructure, the cities aims to demonstrate how to slow or even reverse the adoption of private motor vehicles and create a cost effective and low carbon urban mobility system. Uh, Elevania is located in Zambezia province in the central region of Mozambique. It's the administrative, economic, and uh, political capital. And uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, a coastal city uh, with approximately 20 kilometers inland from the Indian Ocean. This makes the city quite vulnerable to climate change. And it has been hit by extreme flooding in 2005, 2007, 2015. And actually last year, Mozambique as a whole, the central area of the country was hardly hit by the Idais cyclone. Within a few weeks, we also suffered the impact of uh, another cyclone, which is uh, the, Kenneth, the Kenneth cyclone. This raised our awareness to take measures to deal with uh, extreme events, be them naturally or man-made. Uh, Although the people of Kilimani live a relatively low carbon lifestyle by international standards, as I mentioned, they are very extremely vulnerable to the effects of climate change and face the challenges of developing resilient and sustainable infrastructure infrastructure to improve lives at a low cost. In terms of uh, mobility, if we talk in terms of model split, I could mention that 40% uh, is walking, 35% cycling, 17% Four point one percent private taxi, seven point seven motorcycles, and zero point four tricycles. This is according to a very recent uh, PhD thesis made uh, by uh, a resident of Mr. Plasio. So this shows us the small split in, in our city. 
כלימנה, כלימנה סיטי, has become known as the capital of biking in Mozambique. Actually, it's quite famous for its cycling culture, where over a third of journeys in the city are by bicycle. This is in part for the quite plain characteristics of the city, but also because of Mr. Mayor, there, there might be some, I don't know if you have two cameras. Clear leading role, but instead myself. Can you hear me now? Uh, there is some uh, feedback. Can you hear me now? In the, yes, I don't know if there might be two different, uh, um, two different cameras that might be picking up the sound. So, so we can hear you twice. So maybe, maybe if one of them, if you can I meet, see. and then the second one that you started, it uh, seems to be better, the sound, but the other one needs to be muted. Or maybe shut down because then uh, your internet can get slower if uh, yeah. you have both cameras. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep, so continue please, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So I will so continue. I will continue. I, I will just I, say I that-, just uh, say that uh, as, a, as a mayor of, of, of the city, I played uh, a clear role so I took the Uh, hello, Mr. Mayor. Sorry to to interrupt again. This this device might not be working as good as the first one, uh, so we cannot. Okay. Now we can hear you. Perhaps if you want to turn off the camera, there's more bandwidth, so that we can hear you. In this device, yep. Okay. Please let's give it a try yeah. like that. Thank you very much. Is it is it yes. be better now? Yes, we can we can hear you so far. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry for that. So I will say that uh, different. urban periphery than automobiles and larger vehicles. Oh, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm very sorry that uh, that it's, uh, we cannot understand very well in this setting. What I'm saying, okay. I'm so sorry. Um, Perhaps if you can, uh, I will pass now to the panel. And if you can, if you have more time to stay, you, we can uh, 
if you can check back to your first uh, setting, because before we could hear you okay, but when you switch to this new one, it's more difficult. So perhaps if uh, you can check on that, if you have more time and would like to, uh, to stay and after the panel of finish your remarks, if you think the internet setting is better, that would be great. But we certainly okay. understand if you're very busy and you cannot uh, stay the whole time with us. That's fine. I'm around. I, I can say. Okay. Well, we thank you very much uh, for for that time and also, of course, for for the remarks and uh, and also for being uh, such a good partner and advocate, especially for cycling and sustainable mobility and leading the way in Africa, in Mozambique and in Africa, of course. So uh, so please, we're going to hear from four speakers and then I'll check back with you to see if uh, if we are. Um, if, if you can, if you're able to connect and that should be in about half hour or so. So thank you very much, uh, Mayor, for, uh, for staying. Thank you, Ramon. And okay, so next uh, we're going then to pass to uh, uh, our panel uh, that is a, a basically case studies uh, from around the, the world. Uh, and um, and first, we're going to travel then from Mozambique uh, all the way to, um, to Finland. Uh, and we're going to be hearing from Anna Hutunen uh, from the CityCap project uh, in the city of Lahti. So uh, Anna, please, the Zoom spotlight is yours. Thank you, Ramon, and hi, everyone. Um, nice presenting you today. Um, yeah, so I will start with a short presentation about our, our project. Yeah, so um, I hope you can see my screen. And now on the full mode, perfect. Yeah, so hi again, my name is Anna Hutton and I'm the project manager for sustainable mobility and the CityCap project. And I'm working for the city of Lahti, the European Green Capital 2021. And I will share you a case study um, that has been implemented as part of our project, the personal carbon trading pilot on transport emissions. But maybe first a few words about our city. Uh, some of you might know something about Lahti, but I guess for some of you, it might be very unknown territory here, very far in the north. And I must admit hearing um, Amy's presentations, for instance, and also when traveling to, to Mozambique, um, our city has uh, quite a different setting compared to many other cities in the world. So maybe first a few facts to, to put our city into the right context. So the population of Lahti is 133,000 inhabitants at the moment. Um, over 88% 80, 80 of our population lives within um, urbanized areas, but I guess we still cannot really say that um, our city is, is very dense. Um, however, 70% of our residents live within five kilometers of the urban core, which of course makes Lahti very potential cycling and also walking city. So also pretty much a 15 minute city. But we are also very core dependent, so there is a um, lot of work to do. Also, nine out of 10 have urban green area within 300 meters from home. So there is space, there is possibility to, to get recreation and enjoy themselves. And there is also a lot of space. Um, our city has a very ambitious goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2025. But of course, for us, like basically all of us, uh, the transport is the trickiest sector. And also by 2025, um, that will still remain as a challenge. And therefore we have been um, considering what would be the new thing that we could try out in our city. 
Um, our goal is that by 2030, um, more than 50% of all trips would be made with uh, sustainable transport modes. Currently, uh, the share is 45%, um, 11 for cycling and 20, 29 for walking. Public transit is, is very low, it's only uh, 4%. And of course, um, as a, yeah, after COVID, it's, um, has remained even lower, unfortunately. And um, what we do in our project, or what we actually have done in our project, um, since we started the CityCap project um, in the beginning of 2018, um, it has been funded by the Urban Innovative Actions, and that's an European Union uh, funded funding program, and they do fund this kind of innovative radical ideas that are implemented in European cities. Um, we promote sustainable urban mobility, and our aim is to reduce um, the mobility emissions transport. And what we have done in the project, um, first of all, we have um, designed and developed the first sustainable urban mobility plan. Um, it has 13 different measures, both infrastructure, mobility management, and other, other kind of measures in order to um, promote and enable sustainable mobility in our city um, and improve the conditions for a sustainable urban mobility within the next 10 years. Um, we have um, constructed a smart bicycle highway, which is also, also showcasing good infrastructure for cycling and uh, with what we are, we have started to implement the city cycling network of the city. And then um, where I'm going to go into more detail is the personal carbon trading pilot um, that we have been piloting now since last um, September. Um, and what we have done, so basically um, we have developed as the first city in the world, a model and application um, for personal carbon trading on mobility emissions. And the pilot is, is citywide. And of course, um, there has been some, some other uh, small pilots and research projects on, on personal carbon trading uh, previously. For instance, in the UK, uh, they were doing research on it like 10 years ago, um, but back then it didn't really um, um, get on a, on a flight. And after that, there has been some small pilots, one, one Australia on the Norfolk Island and as such. But I, um, as we know, we are the first to do it in a, in a bigger scale. Um, what we have done in the project, we basically started from the scratch um, in the beginning of 2018. Um, we, developed, we developed the model, how you, how, you calculate, um, how you calculate the CO2, how the model should work, and also how the application should work. The idea is that um, the application is very easy to use for everyone who is, um, who is downloading it. It automatically tracks and visualizes uh, the user's mobility. And in that way, it should be um, like attractive to use also because it rewards you for more sustainable transport choices. And maybe more in a detail how it works. Um, so basically we have calculated the carbon cap for the city transport emissions. And based on that, then we have calculated what is the average um, of um, single citizen, citizen in our city. Um, and then when a person starts to use our um, personal carbon trading application, um, they, will first, um, uh, they will first answer a questionnaire. Um, and based on the answers, uh, they will be allocated their personal carbon budget. So basically your uh, living situation affects what kind of carbon budget you are going to have. So um, that was basically, we asked our citizens what they would um, think would be the most fair share for the budget. And they decided that it has to be, there has to be um, possibility to have more credits if you live very far away from the city center, if you have many kids, um, or if you, for instance, work very far away. 
And then um, based on your um, answers, you will be allocated your weekly carbon budget. And then you will be um, traveling around and you will be using your budget based on your uh, transport choices. And um, of course, if you go below your budget, um, you will be uh, rewarded. And if you exceed your budget, um, well, you won't be punished um, and you're going to have a new chance uh, the coming week. But of course, maybe you might feel some social pressure of, of not uh, behaving and performing so well. Um, and then um, when you go below your budget, you will earn some uh, virtual credits. And then um, after that, you can exchange those on the marketplace of the application um, to, for instance, bus tickets or bicycle lights or, or things like that, or some discounts on local uh, cafes or shops. So that's like the basic idea in a nutshell. Um, we are researching how does the use of the app affect the people's um, behavior. So if, if the users are changing their behavior because of using the application, and also what is the motivation behind the change? If it's like, why are they using the application? Do they want to use it because they want to be more environmental friendly? Um, do they use it because they want to see their data? Uh, or is it just because they want to get the rewards that they are able to get? Uh, but these are all things that uh, we are going to have the results um, in the beginning of the next year, since the uh, COVID lockdown a little bit postponed the actual start of the pilot phase. So we have been gathering the data uh, throughout the summer and, and fall now. And well, of course, there will still be some uh, um, effects on the data, but let's see what's, what's going to happen. Um, but what we already uh, were able to get, um, we got very interesting data um, uh, in, in mobility in Lahti during the first lockdown in the spring. So basically we were able to see when comparing to other data sources um, that the data was really um, representative and that basically um, the mobility as such was uh, decreased with 50%. And for instance, public transit with 80% from the 5% uh, level. So of course you can, um, yeah, you can see that that's not maybe the development that we want to see. But of course then uh, walking and cycling uh, increased during these months. And of course, what we also get uh, from, from the uh, users like when we put it all together, we get very valuable GIS data for the planning purposes. For instance, here we have analyzed the uh, favorite cycling routes of the users of the application. Um, and of course, later on, we can use this data when we check our plans and see what we have to do in, in which parts of the, of the city. Um, but yeah, here very um, shortly, my overview of the, of the project. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hutnen. Um, thanks for, uh, for, those, uh, for those remarks and for your presentation. And also thanks for everything you're doing in Lahti and for showing the way in a city uh, that size. Um, welcome, we'll back uh, here the, um, the spotlight uh, and uh, welcome to those of you that has joined late in this panel. In, we're right now in the middle of a panel to rethink um, urban mobility and space. We're in the middle of, uh, of basically showcasing case studies from around the world, uh, uh, both in the global north as well as the global south and in different moments of development, different sizes from smaller and mid-sized cities like Lahti and Kilimani to bigger cities like Fortaleza and London. Um, I want to remind um, everyone, I don't know if the spotlight, if the host can uh, uh, bring back the, the spotlight, we're going to be switching. 
uh, soon, uh, panelists. Uh, but I want to remind everybody that there is a Q&A, a question and answers feature uh, in your Zoom webinar down uh, there. And please use it as we go along this panel uh, because there's going to be Q&A um, later on after all the, we have heard from all the speakers. And next, uh, we're going to in, increase us in size of the city. We're going to uh, now from Finland all the way to Brazil, um, uh, to the city of Fortaleza in the Northeast of Brazil, a city of over 2.5 million uh, population. And we have with us Mariana Gomez, who is uh, an architect and urban planner in the Municipal Secretariat for Public Services. So uh, Mariana, muito obrigado. Uh, and the Zoom spotlight is yours. Hello everyone, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, I brought um, some general ideas or of projects, actually the projects we've been developing for Fortaleza since 2013 uh, in presenting like what happened to, to these policies in the face of the fight against COVID. Uh, some of the things we managed to expand and other things we try to maintain. So let's take a look up in Fortaleza. I'll start the presentation just showing where we are. We are in our feast of Brazil. We are 2.6 million uh, population. Uh, and a quite dense city and uh, with a very large car uh, vehicle fleet. We have approximately one vehicle for every 2.5, uh, 2.4 inhabitants. And the transportation sector is the one that is mostly responsible for CH CO2 emissions. And like many cities around the world, we started with this, uh, this common mobility paradigm of prioritizing cars. So the city was planned initially with the focus on cars, but throughout the years, we've been managing to switch this paradigm into the prioritization of the most vulnerable users, pedestrians, cyclists, and public transport users. And that's all go around our vision of future of a city focused on people. And of course, we have this three main axes, the cycling and the road safety and pedestrians and the public transport. And some of them like, for instance, for the cycling, oh, sorry. And uh, in general, like the results of all these policies throughout the years, the main one we are very proud of uh, is that we managed to reduce our death rates on the fatalities on, on road crashes. For, uh, for more than 50% in less than 10 years. So that's a great accomplishment. Of course, we had many other uh, results of the projects we've been implementing. And having started this, like starting with all these projects throughout these years, when the COVID pandemic started and it hit us hard around March this year, some of the projects contributed for the city's resilience to respond. Uh, and we started with COVID with these assumptions related to urban mobility that we needed to mitigate the health risks in travel and that the public transport users, they would shift to other modes uh, in the following months. And we wanted to make sure that this migration would occur mainly to walking and cycling because they could also move to cars and motorcycle. And so before the COVID, we carry out a orig origin destination survey and we realized that 71% of the travels in Fortaleza were up to five kilometers only. So that fits a lot on this 15 minutes uh, city uh, concept. And as a result of this project uh, of the, the, all the policies we've implemented and also I believe because of this distance that mainly, mainly the majority of people cover, uh, our modal division is mainly pedestrians for 32%. Then we have public transport with 21, 28, cars with 26, motorcycles with 9% and 5% for bikes. And that means that 65% of the trips here in Fortaleza were made by sustainable modes. And of course, with the pandemic, we realized that a share of the public transport users would migrate to different modes, as I previously said. 
And what we needed to do is create the necessary conditions to stimulate, to encourage people to cycle and walk instead of moving to motorized modes. And just to mentioning, like the, starting with the cycling policies, we expanded our projects and try to create connectivity. So the main things we have, the projects we have was the expansion. We continue expanding our cycling network. We started start expanding our main bike share system and also the leisure cycling lane when it was possible to return because during lockdown, it wasn't allowed. Um, it was an alternative for leisure for the population. And it's worth mentioning that we managed to uh, expand all these projects through some of the of the resources we got from parking fares. All collected parking fares goes towards cycling policies. So we had this like by February 2020, we were, were ready from 68 kilometers to 286 kilometers on our cycling network expansion. And now in November, we've reached 347. So we managed to implement 60 kilometers of cycling network in just eight months. That's a lot for us. And here are some examples of the cycling network we have and we're trying to make them as protected as possible from other modes and as a result we we've reached this point of having 50 percent of the population living nearby a cycling infrastructure that's on at least 300 meters away and we are the city with the highest percentage among brazilian capitals so an image of, in our uh, share bike systems, we have four. Bicicleta is the main one, but we also have one integrated with public transport. We have one for kids. And we also have a, a corporate uh, bike share system for public servers. So what, again, in February, we were at 112 stations and we managed to expand to 183. So we implemented 71 share share bike stations around the city, moving to peripheral areas of the city as well, going to low income neighborhoods. And our goal is to reach 210 by 2021. And again, the leisure cycling lane, it came back in October and it was a good breath, like a good breath of hope for people that could move around the city for leisure. It happens only on Sundays. And we've seen a lot of movement there because people are looking to go around the city and play sports and have some fun. Uh, in terms of road safety and pedestrians, basically we, we implemented a lot of interventions throughout the years uh, of traffic calming uh, interventions and urban technical urban tactical urbanism interventions. And we hoped that this would guarantee uh, provide better walkability for the people and safer. Uh, we've managed to, during the pandemic, we've reduced the speed limits of a few uh, main avenues from 60 to 50 kilometers. And we started this micro park uh, intervention where we're trying to create green spaces closer to the, to the neighborhoods. So just a few examples to illustrate the kind of interventions we've done. This is a tactical urbanism intervention around a cultural center. Uh, this is around a children's hospital. We've managed to implement many road safety elements. This is in the city center, so we created more sidewalk um, so people could walk better and safer. And also always looking at prioritizing uh, pedestrians. In this case, here is a, a micro park we just implemented where it used to be actually a, a, a waste point. You can see by the pictures and look how it is now. So we're trying to simulate thinking on this perspective of making uh, cities for children, uh, trying to simulate this is another micro park we've done and using natural resources as well. And finally, with public transport, uh, we've try to use all the projects we have implemented so far in favor of fighting COVID. And we also strengthened some of the, some, some of the actions. Uh, so I bring you like the dedicated bus lanes we've implemented throughout the years, the smart card uh, for public transport and also our transit mobile app. Um, we didn't implement more 
dedicated bus lanes through uh, during the the lockdown, but we we assure ourselves that having done that, uh, we started we prioritize public transport users and during the COVID, whenever they needed to use public transport, there will be a reduction of travel time guaranteed by the dedicated bus lanes. The smart card nowadays, uh, it's covered almost 98% of the public transport users. So you avoid human contact uh, because people are just using the smart cards and it's individual cards. So we know the information of people. So that help us track uh, uh, data uh, related to COVID like uh, the confirmed cases with the public transport users to learn where they were circulating. And with the public transport, of, with the, the mobile app, Milwaukee, we have over 1 million downloads. And with that, like we give information to the population, to the public transport users about the forecast of the buses. So people had need to wait uh, last time outside uh, waiting for their bus, they'll know when their bus are coming. And also it works as a communication channel with the population. We can inform them about safety measures or whatever information we need to provide. And on top of that, we've attempted to sanitize, to, to install sanitizing stations on the bus terminals. We distributed masks, over a million masks. We intensify cleaning both in our buses, but also on our share bikes. And finally, I close with some lessons and questions. This was in the mind of like changing perspective, perspective and implementing sustainable mobility projects. COVID acceler accelerated some of them. So that show us that this change is possible, but we have many challenges ahead. One of them is fine, finding this balance between the, the financial sustainability of public transport whilst guaranteeing that, that it is safe for the population. And we believe that can be done through integration and subsidy because nowadays our public transport runs only by, it's all supported by the fare collected with, from the public transport users. And another challenge is how to continue stimulating cycling to avoid that the population migrates to motorcycle. That's important for us because motorcycle is, uh, is the main mode of, of transport uh, related to fatalities, road safety to road fatalities. And finally, how to, to implement, continue implementing the sustainable mobility projects in the face of an economic crisis we are facing. And that's all, thank you very much and I'm open for questions. Muito obrigado, eh, Mariana. Um, great example for the rest of the world. And uh, in terms of the question, actually, we're going to go through the panelists and then have questions and answers. Uh, yeah, uh, later on. But uh, but yeah, great example for the rest of the world that we have in Fortaleza. I'm sure all of us sitting right now in the global north. Uh, and with the colder temperatures, we wish we were walking and cycling in the streets of Fortaleza uh, right now. Uh, you know, so uh, congratulations on everything you have achieved. We can see why you, uh, Fortaleza, won the Sustainable Transport Award two years ago and celebrated the mobilized conference that ITDP organized together with the Volvo Educational Research Foundation and, and your municipality. And it was one of the great international transport conferences before uh, the world had to lock uh, you know ourselves up uh, in our houses uh, so so we have uh, good memories of that i want to also uh, remind people of the sustainable transport award uh, that a, a committee of many of the organizations that are participating in en route to cop 26 uh, give every year fortaleza won it two years ago pune india uh, won it last year and Jakarta in Indonesia uh, won it this year and uh, we're always looking for uh, good examples to uh, highlight in these uh, competitions so uh, so we hope that um, that uh, you can think in your own countries and in places that you are to um, uh, you know to be able to um, to submit uh, you know different uh, cities 
uh, to be considered for the Sustainable Transport Award. Uh, and so I want to also remind people, you have some of you have been using the Q&A, the question and answer uh, part of your um, of the Zoom, uh, but uh, it would be great if uh, we have a good uh, discussion in a little bit. Uh, but well, next uh, we're going to hear from Lily Matson, uh, who's the Chief uh, for Safety, Health and Environment uh, in Transport for London. Uh, and Lily, uh, let's see if uh, you are now okay. You are yeah. in on screen. Uh, do you want me to share screen with your presentation or you want to do it? Uh, do you want to do it? I think it might be more technologically robust. Okay, good. So I will be sharing my screen in uh, now and then as soon as we have that, you can uh, go ahead and um, start. Uh, so... Okay. Here we are. You just uh, let me know when you want me to uh, to press next. Yeah. Are you yeah. able to go to full screen, maybe? Yep. There we are. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, well, it's early evening in London. Um, so uh, good evening, everyone, and having a good day. Um, I wanted to share with you, I guess, sort of the evolution of our activity in London. Um, during the past year, uh, which is really built upon uh, the work that we had put in place to try to enable the city to grow sustainably moving. But it's been very interesting how we've had to accelerate and be much more agile um, in terms of adapting our approaches. And I think uh, we had been previously, and I think um, that that will be very beneficial. I'm just going to video off just to maintain my bandwidth. Um, so just, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, but London's the biggest city we've been talking about. It has a population of around eight and a half million. Uh, and that population has been growing uh, with the forecast that it would grow to around 10 million. So just moving on to the next slide then, Ramon. Um, the, if we look at what's been happening with travel over the last, say, 15 or 20 years, we've been following a journey um, of definitely reducing car use because it's been the only the, the city has been able to grow and it's grown very significantly over this time um, and it's over this time obviously you can see that it has been this transition gradually to uh, increasing active travel and particularly uh, increasing growth of public transport so we currently have a mode share uh, within where around 64% of all journeys are either by uh, public transport, walking or cycling. And as you'll see in, in my last slide, we have a, an objective that over time that increases to 80%. Um, and we were lucky, I think, going into the, the pandemic to have a very clear strategy that was already informing uh, how we were using public space and, and trying to shape travel. In London. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, that's, that strategy was set out a couple of years ago by our mayor, that's Sadiq Khan, and has given us some very clear goals to be aiming for. Um, and these have, these have stood true and strong actually throughout the pandemic. The, the aim of uh, increasing transport and particularly at we've really seen during the pandemic uh, the impacts of having an unhealthy population. So many of our citizens have been badly affected by coronavirus because they have underlying health conditions. Um, and that has meant that they've been much more vulnerable to the impacts of this, this terrible virus. So the, the objectives that we've built into the, the transport strategy are very explicitly around public health, around increasing active travel, not only because it makes sense in transport terms, but because it makes sense in public health terms. Um, and that obviously, if you're talking about public health, means that you have safety as well. So we have an objective of Vision Zero, um, and, and similar to some of the other cities have also achieved around, um, well, since the middle of the year 2000, we've reduced uh, the number of people being killed or seriously injured by about 35%. 
Um, we aim obviously to be a zero emission city and, and this goal, which was set only a few years ago to be zero emission by 2050. Now, looking at that and thinking, uh, we already have the, the target that we will be zero emission by 2030 in our railways. I think basically we will bring forward this target next year. On public health have been really important in terms of as we've gone through the pandemic. So, just moving on to the next slide. Um, the, 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 the focus as we went into the pandemic. Uh, was clearly one of trying to ensure that we uh, could help London move safely and sustainably. We saw that um, the, the the ridership, people using our public transport network, fell dramatically, and that was because we advised them not to use it. Um, so there was the people using London Underground fell to only five percent of normal ridership, and the only around one quarter of normal ridership, and the bus people using the buses fell to around 50%. And there was a real uh, backlash in terms of people using cars more. So we were, had a very clear plan about boosting active travel, people walking and cycling, not only with physical changes to the road network, but with promotion and training. So just moving on to some of our examples. So London is an uh, old and often ugly city um, that is in desperately in need of sort of reshaping. So this is, uh, an example of a gyratory, old gyratory. It's right in the middle of the oldest part of the city. And if you flip on one slide, uh, you'll see that um, with, I move on one more slide. Uh, this one more, Ramon. Yes. He they're actually more in outer London. We're right in the depths of North uh, London. And what you flip between there is two quick chains of a high street, um, pedestrianizing it and giving much more space to people um, and, and cycling. And I think I've got one more. If we go forward one more. Again, this is in a typical outer London high street. And then with the, the, the road, uh, reintroduce space for people to, to travel by foot and by bike. Um, now, these schemes took several years actually to deliver and quite significant. And what happened in May and June is we realized that if we were going to respond effectively to pandemic, we would need to go a lot faster. So a lot of the schemes that we've delivered since then, and I don't have any pictures actually to share with you, but there were similar pictures in some of the other presentations in terms of pop up bike lanes, very quick reconfiguration of street space. It's actually been fantastically successful right across um, the city. So we've delivered over uh, 60 kilometers of new bike lanes, I think around 30 kilometers more are planned just in the next couple of months. Around 22,000 meters of road space has been reallocated to pedestrians. And we've been working with the local administrations, the London boroughs, uh, with over 600 local schemes to create traffic filters, safe spaces around schools. And it's, it's really been quite an amazing transformation. A lot of this has been done um, with very light touch infrastructure and also with the basis that it's potentially temporary. Um, it's been introduced under measures which are called experimental traffic orders. So there will be a big debate in London as we move out of the pandemic, how many of those schemes stay in place and whether they've actually met expectations in terms of uh, being things in their local neighborhood. If we move on, I think there's a couple more. Uh, it's not so relevant now. We just move on one more, Ramon. Thank you. So with the, with the uh, aim that I set out with at the beginning of the, the progression to of a uh, issue that we face is 
uh, have continued. You're cutting off a little bit, uh, uh, Lily. I'm staying you... frightened. Okay. Can you stick in your number? We can, I mean, we, we get most of what you're saying, but uh, but yeah, the last uh, 30 seconds or so has been very uh, difficult. Okay, I'll wrap up quickly then. Um, by just saying, yeah, just saying, um, obviously that uh, we face great uncertainty in terms of public transport ridership in London. Um, and therefore, the overall emphasis on uh, how we achieve our active travel and public transport growth is, is really challenging. Um, and I guess that's something that all of our cities will need to think about in terms of how we grow out of the pandemic. And because my connection is not very good, I'll stop talking now. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Lily. We could get most of what you said and thanks so much for uh, your presentation and for uh, everything that you're uh, doing in in London and uh, showing us the way, of course. Um, so thank you very much. So next we're going to hear from uh, Yunus uh, Arikan, who's the Director of Global Advocacy uh, for ICLE, which is uh, Local Governments for Sustainability, and also the local government and municipal authorities uh, focal point to the UNFCCC. He's a great friend and a colleague. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, ICLE has been a lead, uh, leader in everything that it's around climate change, cities, and with all the different urban issues. So, of course, transport, mobility, urban design for uh, space, etc. cetera, um, they have been a leader. So, Yunus, if you can uh, basically uh, wrap this uh, panel and case studies with, uh, with some remarks, we would really appreciate it. And uh, the Zoom spotlight is yours. Thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ramon. It's always a pleasure to join the transport community, uh, good friends and, and good partners. Um, I remember in 2013 with Corny, there was the UNFCC workshop in Warsaw, where we were presenting the cities and the transport as, at that time, it was seen as a headache, uh, but now it's seen as the hope for uh, a better future. I think all these years, the SLOCAT uh, leadership and SLOCAT partners and uh, ICLE and, and, and the rest of our, our colleagues uh, have been really now enjoying uh, those success stories. And I, I think we're encouraged to do more. And in that sense, once again, thanks a lot for the invitation. Congratulations, of course, first to, to UITP, our, our, our partner as well, for their commitment for climate neutrality. That I think, of course, very valuable because uh, local governments obviously um, have the responsibility for policy making, but without their utilities, without their operators uh, supporting them, it's impossible for them to reach those goals. So, um, and a network like UITP committing to climate neutrality is definitely a huge boost to our efforts. And I, I'm very happy to hear all those success stories from most of the members of ICLE. Um, and even with London, we have a very long standing relationships, but Lati, uh, Fortaleza. What I noticed um, in this, let's say, presentations, and I was thinking for the, since the beginning of the evolution of, of our efforts. I mean, uh, let's be realistic, um, transport uh, or, or, or let's say the change of lifestyle in, in a fossil fuel or fuel oil or almost fuel oil dependent cities is one of the hardest things. You can change your cooking service in a, in a building, you can change your energy service in a, in a, in a city uh, easily, but changing from private cars, changing from a city who is what, which is designed for a, uh, let's say, a private car dominated uh, structure to a public uh, transport or an environmental friendly structure is really one of the biggest challenges. And I remember while listening to Fortaleza or even uh, my dear friend and, and our distinguished leader, uh, Manuel, um, the, the way you move is also a revolutionary uh, effort. Uh, I remember in the 70s, Curitiba, uh, when they were introducing this uh, waste to ticket to access, to enable access for urban poor to the cities, that continued again also in Medellin, for example, this cable car, again, the urban poor access to the cities. Um, the thing that we are now changing with this uh, accessibility through uh, biking and walking is that to change the way we are living in cities. And that I think is the interesting thing because 
this was one of those unthinkable. And thanks to COVID that we are now able to start thinking big. Um, many of our leaders are now able to think that the things that was un impossible, impossible to think about is now doable with, with uh, one third of global population being in lockdowns for a couple of weeks and then still survive again. And even more importantly, that the fact that the more you are connected, the better you can resist these challenges, giving this confidence to the people that, that together we can solve issues. I think that is the biggest benefit of this 15 minute city as well in that sense that um, in fact, we are in the effort of redesigning our cities. And the other point is that I think we were for a long time uh, when we are saying 200 cities in 200 years or so, we were always th thought there is no city without a car, but in fact, many of our cities are thousand years old. We have city centers, which are uh, the streets and the buildings, the, the corners, the, the gardens, that was much more environmentally friendly. And in fact, we are recapturing our this legis legacy from those uh, environmental friendly living with modern technology. I mean, I was impressed with Lati's uh, efforts of, of sustainable mobility app. And, and, and now I think it is the time when they're the leader of the, the champ during the green capital, it's, it's time to spread everywhere in, in Europe, this kind of efforts. Um, and, and, and coming back also, this efforts of, um, it's not just bike only. I mean, it is really uh, to change the, uh, the, the effort that uh, I remember in 2013, when we were trying to work with Suwon, the first eco-mobility district in a city center, which is one month car free. At that time, it was something unimaginable. Again, now it's becoming a fashion. So that's why I think um, it is really good to see that from the north and south, from small to big, um, it, is, it is now possible to, to convince that it is time in the redesign phase after COVID to make some ambitious commitments, to think big, uh, to, to, to think bold, uh, and even shape bold, but, but also practice what you are doing bold in the sense that the way you design your cities, the way you implement your uh, policies with citizen engagement, I think that is the key uh, that shows what, what uh, London and, and also Fortaleza show that that is probably one of the things that makes urban, um, let's say, mobility different than, um, excuse me, uh, I forgot to turn off my Skype. So uh, the uh, the urban freight, uh, the difference of the other transport modes. For example, if you look at the the the, the uh, overseas transport by flight or, or maritime, it is far away from uh, from the control of the ordinary citizens. You are much more dependent on what the service providers are uh, offering to you. But in the case of urban mobility, I think it's much more in the hands of the people and the sustainability benefits, the, the air quality, the life uh, livelihoods are really making us much more convincing that it's time for uh, redesign our cities. And finally, maybe one thing that was not too much to discussed here, uh, that would be also again, a contribution to this discussion is uh, urban fright is one of the, the biggest challenges um, in eco-mobility of Ikle's festivals. Uh, we have started this one month car free zones and now it's expanded and over these years we also have started to notice that it is not the individual uh, the individuals in the city but it's the the urban fright uh, that's a community which is increasing increasing the safety threats and increasing the air pollution highest uh, although they occupy less space so we just released a couple of weeks before um, uh, the eco mobility principles as well as an offer to urban leaders so that they can combine also the way they plan their cities, the way they uh, think of how to move uh, the citizens, but also move their products. And uh, the final comment is, is that uh, that's probably the, the thing that Ramon, you will very, very understand this. Why are we living in the cities? Um, it's like, why do you eat? I mean, there are some people in the world who, who eat to live uh, and some people who live to eat in that sense. We have been for years and years coming to the cities for job, for better, let's say, uh, accessibility for economic benefits. But nowadays, especially this 15 minute city type of efforts, I think we are trying to create that the goal is a better living. So we, our goal should be how to introduce better living, even in the old or even the new cities around the world. Uh, and as long as we keep this in mind, the priority to offer a decent living, I think we can much better uh, convince um, 
our designers and our, our citizens to be following this kind of and supporting this kind of efforts. And in that regard, my final comment, um, over this period, in the next 10 years is the key thing uh, that we are talking about is that the, the more we can push our local leaders to aim for climate neutrality commitments like within the network, we have 500 cities more, and to tell them that, look, there are solutions available. There are technologies that are available. There are partners available. So don't be afraid. And, and the citizens asking this kind of changes, it all like this ambition loop that champions have always been telling us that it is possible to make the transformation. It, it is possible to make this exponential change uh, of our, our cities and livelihoods uh, in our lifetime that, that in the next 10 years, we can see a complete reshift and rebuilding of our, our cities. And in that regard, I think, what has been created here with this transport community is extremely valuable. And I'm so proud so many of our leaders and experts are, are demonstrating that it is doable. Uh, and we as ICLE, of course, with all your partners uh, are, are here to help them and, and disseminate this message and make it much more faster and easier and much more accessible, of course. So these are my uh, input or let's say uh, closing or concluding remarks. Uh, and once again, congratulations to all the cities and the partners in making this bold actions. Okay, thank you very much, Yunus, uh, for that. I will, I mean, this concludes this part of the panel. I would like to go back to uh, Mayor de Araujo uh, to see if uh, we can, he can uh, offer the concluding remarks that, uh, that were not able to happen uh, before because of the Wi Fi connectivity. And as we can see, both uh, all the way from England to uh, to, uh, to Mozambique, uh, we have difficulties. Of course, uh, you're also in the prime yeah. time for uh, people being using uh, Wi-Fi in their uh, homes. So at least I experienced it here in New York where uh, during the day there's no problems, but once uh, we hit the evening, uh, it becomes much more difficult. So um, Mayor, uh, if you can, uh, offer some uh, some remarks in the next uh, few minutes, please. Let us know if, uh, if that's a possibility. Okay. Yep. Oh, can, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Sometimes I'll I'll let you know if uh, we cannot hear you, and in that moment, uh, sometimes it's good to turn off the camera. But for now, it seems like you're on camera and we can hear you well. So please go ahead, Mr. Mayor. We can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. We are able to hear you. If you if you cannot, perhaps. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Come on. Uh, yes, please go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Well, we, can, uh, we can hear you all the time. So if you start speaking, uh, we'll hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. So I will be very quick then. Uh, in the sense, I was just saying that um, Kilimani City is a very ambitious plan to retain and grow its cycling culture. And we are doing that by facilitating, by facilitating safer cycling via dedicated cycling lanes. The, our main aim is actually to connect the main residential areas to market and commercial zones with cycling lanes. And uh, actually we are currently doing that. That's a, our first phase. And uh, we hope by January and February, we just signed an uh, agreement with uh, the Ministry of Environment uh, in Portugal for our second phase. And we are looking for partners uh, to see if we can secure 
further fun, funding to, to extend the length of cycle lines and serve other streets because we consider it as really, really uh, essential. But uh, as, as I mentioned, when I showed the modal divide in Kilimani, actually walking also is very uh, popular means of uh, moving around the city. So we are also planning to transform some of our roads, main the Avenida Mar Marginal is just a pedestrian and a cycling road. And uh, we here, I just want to conclude by saying that for us in Kalimani, we say that uh, cycling is more than a mode of transport. It's a tool for social cohesion. It's our identity because we managed to bring uh, a formally uh, di discriminated against group of people, of young people who we managed to bring him, to include them and bring them into the centerpiece of the, the municipal policy where they are now like they do contribute with, by paying taxes and uh, also by, we include them and they feel now as part of the city while before they felt as second uh, class citizens. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. We could actually hear you very good uh, uh, right now in this uh, in this part. So uh, so we appreciate. Uh, we're going uh, to then pass to uh, um, for uh, for some time to some uh, question and answers. And I think from what we have gotten in our chat and in the um, in the Q and A, most of the of the questions are. Uh, um, revolve around uh, the challenges or the difficulties um, you know to uh, to do much of, of, uh, of this work that you're all presenting so um, I will go ahead and, and take from some of the of the questions so that the panelists can think we can have a, a few minutes uh, for each person to add uh, to whatever you want. For example, for uh, Mariana, there is a specific uh, uh, question uh, on uh, the, um, uh, let's see now, I, I, I think, oh, that, that why do you limit the speed reduction only to a few major roads? And is it perce uh, perceived lack of acceptance by the citizens? To Aime, there is uh, one about public transportation and uh, what are the current challenges in making public transportation a real success in terms of the public's perception towards, uh, towards it instead of uh, going by private vehicles. And then I think for the, for the rest, uh, you know, think about uh, you know, the, the challenges, especially uh, one person said about the poor cities and poor countries lack of financial power to take advantage of uh, technology. And so basically uh, all the difficulties, no? And also a part of uh, another question links it to the uh, difficulties uh, to encourage mayors uh, or decision makers to support uh, public transport modes and to put barriers, uh, you know? So, uh, so I think all of these we can see like, uh, um, you know this kind of uh, of uh, of um, worries, uh, you know, and and especially coming from uh, it seems uh, well from actually a variety of places, from Turkey uh, to Brazil to the global north as well. So if we can go ahead, uh, also there is one question by Constancio Pedro Maulana uh, on a network uh, for exchanging information for urban planners. And I would say that all the organizations uh, here uh, actually are good resources for that. Uh, I, I speak, of course, on behalf of the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, but so is the International uh, Association for Public Transport. And then uh, with the network of uh, organizations uh, that are under ECLE and also SLOCAT, um, which is uh, the uh, Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport. So 
we have, uh, there's a lot of resources through here, Constancio. And so with that, I, I think, you know, since we're uh, starting to go towards the end of the, of our panel, if each panelist can take into consideration these, uh, um, these questions and, um, and then also think of some concluding remarks and then we'll pass to uh, the conclusion by uh, Dionisio from UITP. So Mariana, if you wanna go first and then I will go with uh, uh, Aime uh, and then uh, Anna, Lili, uh, Yunus and also uh, Mayor Araujo, if you have some concluding remarks. So Mariana, back to you. Thank you, I'm writing some notes down just to don't miss anything. Uh, in answer to the, to the question about uh, why we're doing this uh, limiting speed just in a few major roads, it is that we, you, you, you mentioned, Alice, is the, the lack of acceptance of the citizens. I guess like uh, since we come from this idea, this paradigm of prioritizing cars, it's a big behavior change we need to stimulate to everybody, including decision makers. That answers the other question on how to, to I guess I'll put the two questions, the two answers together on how to stimulate decision makers to also implement uh, sustainable mobility projects. Um, in both cases, is my answer would be data, co uh, collecting data, and also pilot project, projects. Um, data, because like whatever you do, if you can come with some data, oh, I have a third one as well, is building strong partnerships. Um, so with data is like whatever you're trying to do, if you come with data to, to if, you, if you aggregate data on the, on the projects, like showing things on bringing information on how things are done and explaining better the context, you get out of the, this quality, qualitative analysis, which is important into a quantitative analysis. So you know how to, how the impact will be and you can measure that. And so this is one thing good for uh, to, to getting people into implementing some of these projects. Also pilot projecting because um, you don't need to go bright, and especially on these cases of poor cities and countries, we need to, to be smart about how we spend our resources. So you, need, you can start by trying uh, small projects, like implementing some things, trying something out, collecting data and seeing the results before scaling it into a bigger project or program. And also the partnership, what, what we've learned here in Fortaleza, it's very important to, to, to make strong partnerships, including ITDP, Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, WRI, and many other partnerships we've, we've, we've come to have throughout the years because these partners, they bring um, new content and new approaches and way, even ways of communicating with the population and decision makers. So everything is very, uh, um, it's a, it's a, it's, it's small steps to get on a long way, but it's worth it. And I believe that's the way we could do it. Thank you. Muito obrigado, Mariana. Um, thank you very much. And so, Aime, why don't you uh, go next? Uh, there was a question uh, addressed to you in particular. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm super excited to uh, be following Mariana because I, I love learning about Fortaleza and the work that they've done and the work that she's been part of. It's been really cool to see how they've approached it so thoughtfully. Um, and I, I remember when I when I had the great opportunity to be there once upon a time um, and thinking about the way that they leverage data for storytelling and for and for advocacy, but also to understand the impacts. Like it was. It's great. So everyone should go to Fortaleza and learn from them um, when, when we get the opportunity again. Um, I think with public transport, for me, like public transport um, doesn't work for a lot of people because, um, because it's, it's not planned to work for a lot of people. So I think if you want public transport to work for people, make it frequent, make it reliable, make it safe. Um, and I love transit. I don't, I'm a big fan of transit. I only want to take transit. Um, so these are like the, the and I wrote this in the, in the comments, but like 
if if someone can trust that they can take transit and a certain time frame and get to where they need to go, they'll take transit. You know, if they know that they can show up at a transit stop and um, a vehicle will show up within like a couple of minutes, they can. It, it allows them flexibility um, in their lives, so they don't have to do trip planning or look at a schedule or try to figure out like when this one route will come and pick them up. If you can help them uh, with information and wayfinding with um, you know, like how, how do I get from point A to point B? Uh, all of these things are things that are gonna make it easy for people. You wanna make it easy for people to use transit. And I think safety is uh, for women, the biggest uh, barrier to using transit. Um, and then um, also invest in it as like a public good. So this is to come back to the idea that what we're seeing in the, what I'm seeing in the pandemic is this kind of elevation of the role of the public, public space, public goods, like public transit, transit as a public utility um, and the public sector. Like I think more and more um, we're seeing that governance matters <laughs> to quote my governor, um, that I think that we really need to be investing in, in the public realm. Really, we've, I think we've understood how important that is and that includes public transit and it does, it will need investment. I think the model of running just on fair revenues isn't going, it, it undermines the objectives of it being a public good um, in the end. So that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Aime. Okay, what about next we go to Finland, Anna? Yeah, hi, thanks. I think I would like to, to comment on the um, issue of, of um, that being problematic to to get the support of the decision makers and the mayors. Um, I think it doesn't matter where we are, we have the same problems. What we are currently facing when we are um, developing, for instance, the city center transport plan is that what how we plan is like according to the new paradigm of transport planning. But what the decision makers, um, what they basically live with, they still go with the old paradigm. They are very car centric and for them it's very hard to, still very hard to understand why we would need to change. So I think you really need to, you just need to provide hard facts against this, like in my opinion facts, something that you cannot really deny. Like when you can say that building this will save uh, eight times more money for the society, then it's uh, also for them hard to hard to deny and maybe hard to oppose. But I think it it really takes a long time because like, as we know, attitudes are very hard to change and behavior is even harder to change. So um, even though it might see, seem that other cities are well ahead, I think, everyone is still struggling and having the same opponents and having the same same problems when implementing more sustainable transport system for the city. Thank you, Anna. Um, let's uh, have Lily next. Lily. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me a little clearer. Yes. yes. Um, so it's a really interesting discussion and I was thinking about um, public opinion and decision makers and I think some of the things that have helped and to maintain momentum um, are it does really help to have some really clear goals and a strategy at the beginning because then when you go into a crisis you you're not you have something to lean to and it can help you keep some forward progression so the whole emphasis, for example, in our city on vision zero for safety or on zero carbon has been really helpful. Um, and it's allowed us to mobilize different coalitions of communities and stakeholders behind that. Um, and I think that uh, what has become true is that the crisis has allowed people to be much braver in their decisions. Um, because also it's, it's felt like uh, the decisions don't necessarily need to be permanent. So I think it was Mariana talking about uh, experimenting in pilots and I would really recommend this as a way of uh, mobilizing public support and decision makers support. Um, because usually what we're finding is once things are in, people do grow to love them. And we do actually as a community have a lot of evidence um, why uh, 
cities without cars are more successful. So I was looking at the comment for Turkey, for example, and, and you know, lots of different cities and big cities like London can provide successful quantitative information as to why that will work. And we're obviously happy to share that. Um, I think there is a discussion for, you, for UITP and for us more generally around cities that have very mature public transport and how that adapts in future to perhaps changing commuter needs and changing commuter expectations in terms of crowding. Um, because I think the whole perceptions around social distancing and, and how we use crowded spaces has changed. And that's a challenge to us that we'll have to, to work with and make sure that we can win people back onto the, to the network actually, because we had a very mature uh, usage of, of public transport. And I think for us, the challenge moving forward is, is how to, to rebuild that confidence um, in, and make sure that our cities are successful with that. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lily. Um, let's uh, have uh, Yunus. Uh, do you want to come back in? There has been some things in the chat um, with, uh, with your name. So if you want to offer some uh, concluding remarks uh, as well. Thank you, Ramon. And, and I would mainly echo on this connection of, or this issue about how to make bold actions, how to be uh, introducing disruptive change but still getting the, the citizen engagement or citizen support. That is a huge challenge for local, all politicians in the world. And I shared a couple of examples. I mean, if, if you implement right, uh, let's say, uh, tools of citizen engagement, if you communicate, if you talk, if you explain, uh, and if you lead by uh, acting that is the key the, the the people the citizens should believe in their leaders that what is preaching is is not just uh, for fun or that he's not just offering this for uh, for 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 others but he's only already doing itself there are a lot of cases when if if the mayor already starts to use the bike and mayor manuel Araujo knows this very well that there have been cases in izmir mayor of tung soyer was using this for the first time coming to the office by bike or if the city is installing solar powers in the municipal buildings this kind of demonstrative leadership of the cities uh, the city leaders are extremely helpful to convince others and uh, i gave the example of suvon I mean, resistance is always the, in the nature of urban politics, but the mayor of Suwon, after intense discussions with the citizens, he, he demonstrated that, yes, he's interrupting, the, he's, he's, he's changing, the, he's introducing a discomfort, but the, the, the change is for good. And at the end of the two years time, the mayor has won with the highest margin of um, winning majority across the whole Korean municipal elections. Uh, that is again showing that if politicians are courageous enough, if they engage right technical staff, if they empower their uh, experts to, to connect to their citizens, they can win this battle uh, because the citizens are able to follow their leaders if they trust. And the trust is the most important, I think, um, element for, for this kind of uh, changes. And obviously finance and an exchange of experience is critical. Um, and, and we would be happy to, to, to use the ICLE network, the SLOCAD and others to continue that, that the, 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 the doable, the, it's the, the feeling that it is doable, it is done somewhere else, can why don't we do it in, in, in this city as well? I think that is a key thing um, because people much more easily believe or let's say follow when they see, when they touch, when they, when they feel the benefit directly, physically themselves as well. So these are my comments. Uh, and once again, thank you all for, for all the contributions and the questions coming on the, on the chat box as well. Thank you, Yunus. Uh, and last but not least from our panel, uh, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, if you're still there and would like to offer some uh, concluding remarks, you're welcome to. Yes. Thank you very much, Hamo. Uh, I just want to agree with um, what you know said uh, because uh, the role of mayors and local leaders is of a paramount importance in behavioral change. Uh, as we, we all know, mayors and local leaders, they are elected by their peers. It gives them the legitimacy, but also the proximity. Those two issues, legitimacy and the proximity, 
make his uh, 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 change more uh, able. Because when people trust their leaders and when they lead by example, then you know it makes much easier. But of course, I want also to share that you know it 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 is not easy to change uh, behavior of citizens. Sometimes it's a, a very lonely and a very long walk. But one needs to believe in it and uh, slowly uh, bringing in people. But to do that also, there is a very important uh, uh, issue, which is the availability of data. You know, when uh, when some when a leader have got uh, data, when he's got evidence, you know, it can be like halfway in the process of convincing people to change uh, in, in 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 terms of policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Definitely, um, so true. Um, the um, well, I mean, this really concludes our panel, and now I would like to to give the, the spotlight to, to Dionisio Gonzalez and also to thank all the panelists uh, for all your uh, presentations, remarks, your insights. You know, uh, Yunus mentioned, you know, how seven years ago, uh, you know, transport, it was so difficult in the, in the uh, hallways of uh, any of the COP, you know, COP uh, 15, COP 14, and now we're on COP 26. And, Back then, transport was very difficult. We would have one event of uh, transport, and uh, we would have to basically bring or catch the different panelists. And now it's the opposite. Now, uh, transport organizations are highlighted, uh, you know, at the forefront of uh, the action that we need on climate change. I would also say that many of those. Uh, of, of those uh, panels back then were uh, manuals and uh, were uh, mostly uh, panels composed of uh, white men. And so it is uh, a great uh, to see a, a, a panel like the one that we have with, we had just right now with a majority of uh, a female uh, leading the way in different in cities uh, all over uh, the world and different sizes uh, and uh, uh, of cities and it's uh, it's uh, very inspiring and so we hope that this is a trend that will only increase uh, and that uh, and, and it is uh, uh, an honor and a privilege to you know be part of uh, sharing screens with all of you and cannot wait to uh, to uh, be more uh, you know be in person with uh, with each other so uh, Dionisio, uh, if you are in here, um, uh, if you can uh, please offer some concluding remarks and thanks for UITP for your leadership. So back to you. I know that we're one minute over the promise two hours, but uh, we actually had a two and a half hours uh, a prepared uh, this just in case. So uh, please, Dionisio, close uh, the session for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a pleasure for, for the International Association of Public Transport to have uh, co-organized this session on rethinking urban space, uh, urban mobility and space with uh, such a great panelist and, and, and partners. A special thanks, of course, to, to Ramon, to Amy, to Talia and to Philippe for the great uh, work in the, in the preparation. In, uh, in our route to COP26, we would like to insist that the public transport sector and the local governments, um, wait a minute, yeah, and the local governments are united in, in meeting the Paris goals and creating a more inclusive and resilient societies and economies. No? Countries around the world has been really impacted by the pandemic, but it's also true that um, public transport has been, like always, committed to the communities they served. Now we have a great opportunity to build back better. Things are now doable and supported by citizens, as mentioned by Junus and by Lily. And indeed, we can put in quarantine air quality, we can put in quarantine climate change, we can put in quarantine road safety. So a key part of this needed transition will uh, entail a strengthening the role of public transport, the backbone of urban mobility, as an enabler to other economic, social, our environmental metropolitan objectives 
as mentioned by Mariana in Fortaleza, but also by our member Transport for London. At UITP, we love working with facts and data. And the economic benefits of public transport are five times, five times, five times, sorry, higher than the money invested in it. In it. As you know, public transport unlocks very positive benefits and effects in the wider economy by connecting people to their jobs, studies, leisure, allowing for clustering of activities and business development, improving quality of life, supporting tourism, stabilizing property values, etc. So it's also important, and particularly during this crisis period, to mention that worldwide, over 13 million local jobs are linked to public transport. And for every direct job in public transport, 2.5 additional jobs exist in the supply chain and the local economy. Indeed, a recent study by the United Nations and the International Labour Organization suggests that stimulating the use of public transport by doubling the investment could create up to 5 million additional jobs. Of course, if we are to limit the rise in global temperature as per the Paris Agreement, we must cut global emissions every year for the next decade. As outlined in the UITP Declaration on Climate Leadership, developed by Philippe Turner, this requires more ambitious national commitments and targets to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Again, non-state actors like the public transport sector have already shown increased determination and commitment to achieving a low emission future. But let's be practical. Let's come back to the basics. The fastest and most cost efficient way to decarbonize people's daily mobility and then substantially, substantially reduce their footprint is to promote public transport, walking and cycling, as we have seen in examples from various continents today. The shift to a zero carbon future is underway. It will create good jobs, driving sustainable growth, building resilience, protecting people's health and a better future for all of us. As clearly shown in this session, we are not talking about technology. Uh, we are talking about geometry. The battle in cities is for the urban space, spaces that foster health and well-being, as mentioned by Amy. There are a number of aspects to be considered, from integrated land use and mobility planning to infrastructure deployment, institutional reforms, removal of regulatory barriers, the use of data, as mentioned by the mayor, uh, of, uh, in, in Mozambique, and of course, the promotion of behavioral changes. We have heard about all this from our great panelists today. Thanks again. And what is particularly needed and has been shown also in these case studies today, from Mozambique to Finland, is a strong political commitment to support and to scale up public transport. Of course, we do need also a stable funding framework in place through specific mobility funds through air market taxes or through uh, congestion charges. All in all, thanks very much for your participation. Looking forward to the sessions tomorrow and on Thursday on this en route to COP26 event. All the best, stay safe, and over to you, Ramon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dionisio, and uh, also Philip from UITP, my colleague Aime Gautier from ITDP. Thanks to Igle and, and Yunus and of course, all the panelists, Mr. Mayor uh, de Araujo, thank you very much for your participation and for your leadership. And also to Ana and uh, Lili from, and Mariana uh, from Fortaleza, from London, from uh, Lahti. And, uh, and yeah, thanks for all the participants and the people that have uh, stayed with us through this panel. Uh, we uh, please uh, stay connected with en route uh, to COP26. Uh, we still have eight more sessions with uh, great speakers through the next two days. So uh, with that, you know, stay connected, stay safe, and thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Obrigado. Thank you so much. Thank you.